Hello everyone and welcome to another Juniors and Early Teens lesson. Don't forget to scroll down, click subscribe, and hit the bell so that you get notifications when new content is uploaded. The links to both the Juniors and Early Teens lesson are down in the description below. You're welcome to look at one or both of those, but today in this video we're going to be focusing a bit more on the Early Teen lesson. But before we get into the lesson, I want to ask you, what is your favorite outfit? Go ahead and pause the video so that you can have that discussion with those around you, and please remember to comment down below so that I can see your answers as well. My answer to this question is not really too exciting. I pretty much just wear jeans and t-shirts whenever I get the chance. So now on to the early teen lesson. And when I said earlier that we would be focusing on the early teen lesson, what I meant by that was I looked at both lessons, the junior and the early teen, and when I looked at the early teen lesson, I read the title, and that was it. I mean, I read more of what was in the lesson, but that was it. I decided to focus on the early teen lesson because that meant I got to film a video with this. Yeah, that's right. Pastor Ryan owns a gladius, which is the short sword that the Roman soldiers would use. So when you're reading through the New Testament and you come across stories that have Roman soldiers in them, all of them probably most definitely had a gladius like this one. I get to pull this out for this lesson because one, I own it and can do what I want, and two, because the early teen lesson talks about the armor of God. Paul talks about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, so I'm going to put away this sword and pull out my sword of the Spirit. You should pull yours out too and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. The whole section is verses 10 through 20, but in this video, I'm going to read for you verses 13 through 17. Go ahead and pause the video so that you can look up Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to encourage you to read the whole section, verses 10 through 20, as I, for time, am just going to read verses 13 through 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17 reads, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up learning about the armor of God, it was always pictured to me like this. Like a medieval knight, a full suit of armor, where you can't even see the person who is wearing it. Now, to be fair, I don't think it's wrong to think of the armor of God in that way, because Paul was simply making an illustration about God. It's not a hard and fast thing what the armor of God actually looks like. But when you take a step back and actually think about it, Paul was probably talking more about what a Roman soldier would look like. I'm sure you've seen pictures and videos of Roman centurions and soldiers, and they're not actually fully covered. Once again, not that it makes a difference in light of an illustration, but the Roman soldier is what the Ephesians would have been thinking of when they were reading this letter that Paul sent them. Now, like I said, Paul is simply making an illustration for God prepping us for battle against Satan, his demons, and the temptations that they bring. Which means you could make this illustration with really any suit of armor, even Iron Man's or the Mandalorian's. And while it's okay to make illustrations like that, I think it is important to take a look at the Roman soldier to see if Paul had any specific reasons for choosing this imagery. For example, the first on his list is the Belt of Truth. I did some digging to see what part of a Roman soldier's uh, clothing, armor, would be the belt. Turns out, in Greek, the original language that the New Testament was written in, the word belt actually isn't there at all. All it really says is to just wrap around your waist in truth. Which, to be fair, does sound an awful lot like a belt. But when you look up what the Roman soldiers all wore, that doesn't really actually help it and narrow it down any. There was a belt that held their weapons. Is it talking about that belt? There was another belt that signified rank. Whether they were just a common foot soldier, whether they were a centurion, legionnaire, uh, wherever their standing was in the military. And while this isn't a belt, it does wrap around the waist, 
they wore the plated skirt. Which, just as a fun fact in my research, I found out that Roman soldiers actually didn't like wearing pants because they thought the pants were too feminine. So I don't know when we made the switch between pants and skirts between the genders, but it wasn't Rome. And maybe I'm digging too deep into Paul's illustration, but that does sort of change what he means. Like, what are we wrapping around our waist in truth? Because if it's the belt that holds weaponry, well, the sword of the spirit is the word of God, which is the Bible. So it could be saying that the Bible, scripture, is built on truth. It is true. If it's the belt that signifies rank, it could be saying that it is true that we are part of God's army, we are part of God's family as his children. If it's the armored skirt, then maybe it's truth that men should go back to wearing skirts. I'm just kidding on that one. I'm not entirely sure what the truth could be other than part of the armor of God. Maybe the fact that it protects some of your more, shall we say, vulnerable areas? The breastplate of righteousness, I feel like is pretty standard. It protects your chest, things that could easily kill you if they are stabbed or shot with arrows. There were two thoughts I had about the breastplate. One, it could signify how uh, righteousness is a matter of asking God for a new heart, a heart that seeks and yearns to follow after him. Also, maybe I'm getting a little too technical again, but in the Greek, the word that is used for righteousness can also mean justice. It could show how we are protected by God's justice. It could be a statement on how Christians are supposed to stand up against injustice. Moving on, next he talks about the shoes. What struck me about the shoes on this reading is that I've always viewed the shoes as the shoes of the gospel of peace. But the version I read, feel free to rewind and rewatch if you need to, makes it pretty clear that the shoes are the readiness that's from the gospel of peace. Personally, I think that's an incredible distinction because to me it says that the gospel, the good news that Jesus has saved us, should motivate us to get up and get going. We should be so excited, so passionate about the gospel, about the fact that Jesus has saved us, that we want to get up and get a move on so that we can tell other people that good news too. The next piece of the armor is the shield of faith. I like this illustration because it shows the imagery of having faith in God that he will protect us. What's interesting though is that the Roman soldiers varied between two different shields. The first one was smaller and was circular, kind of about the size and shape of Captain America's shield. While I couldn't verify for sure in my research, I'm pretty sure they're talking about the other one. Because the smaller round shield is better for more close-up, hand-to-hand or sword-to-sword -sword combat. But the second shield is larger and is a big rectangle. Which means two things. One, it's larger and will probably do a better job of protecting you against flaming arrows, as the Bible says. And second, the Romans had what they called a tortoise formation. I'm not kidding. I couldn't find a free image to use of this, so go ahead and go to Google Images and type in Roman soldier tortoise formation. In that formation, the people in front would hold their shield so that it was protecting them in front. But the people behind them would all hold their shields over their head. And they were large enough and they would interlock with each other to form a giant shell over the whole army. And due to the shields being interlocked, if a volley of flaming arrows was fired down upon them, there'd be no way that they could get through that barricade or that shell, tortoise formation, of shields. Which if that's the case and that's the shield that Paul was referring to, I think that says an awful lot about having a strong community of faith. So you and me, as we join our faith together, our faith in God together, I think we stand an even greater chance of withstanding the flaming arrows that the devil and his demons are firing our way. Next up is the helmet of salvation. I'm very glad that Paul used the helmet as the illustration for salvation for two reasons. First, the helmet is what stands between you and your enemy of a direct headshot, a direct kill. Except, I guess, maybe the shield, depending on how you're holding it. But if any of you play video games, you'll know that if you hit them in their chest, it like takes away their hit points. But if you're able to get a clean shot to their head, they drop. So in that context, a helmet of salvation makes a lot of sense. The second reason I like this illustration is because when we accept Jesus' sacrifice as our own, as we get to know him and grow in our relationship with Christ, it should become clearer and clearer 
that we should have a head knowledge that we are saved. Now I know from like a logical, practical standpoint, we're not really going to know for sure whether we're saved or not until Jesus comes back. But I do think that when we have a relationship with Jesus here on earth, we should be able to know a head knowledge that we are saved in him. Partly because of faith, but also because, well, let me put it this way. If your best friend is throwing a birthday party, are you gonna be invited? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna be invited. Unless it's like just a family thing. But if they're having a party with a bunch of their friends, you're pretty much guaranteed an invite. But when it gets close to his birthday and you notice that other friends have gotten invitations and you haven't, you're gonna start getting worried. And maybe you even start asking this friend, hey, is my invitation on its way? Is it in the mail? And he's just like, oh yeah, it's probably on its way. Yeah, just, you know, we're, we're friends, we're friends, right? Your invitation's gonna be there. And you wait and wait and that invitation never comes. And so you decide to just show up at the party anyways. And your friend is like, oh, hey bro, where's your invitation? And you're like, but you said it was probably on its way. So I just sort of assumed that I was invited, maybe? And your best friend is like, nah, you're not invited. Sorry, you gotta go home. That'd be a pretty cruddy thing to do, right? So if you've accepted Jesus' sacrifice as your own and you're having a relationship, a friendship with him, as long as we continue that relationship, continue that friendship, and continue growing in Christ, I think it's pretty safe to say that we can have a head knowledge of our salvation. Of course, don't take it too far and get prideful about it, but if you have that friendship with Jesus, I think you can be pretty confident in that fact. And now we're getting to the part that I've been waiting for, the sword of the spirit. Although when you really think about it, doesn't it strike you as a little weird that the Bible is illustrated as the weapon? Personally, I think it's a little weird, but it becomes more normal when you remember that our fight isn't against other humans, but our fight is against Satan and his forces. And in that fight, we need God's words. We need God's promises to be able to combat against Satan, his demons, and the temptations that they throw our way. And of course, to do this, you need all pieces, which means you need God. We do have enemies out there, and we need to fight them. Thankfully, God provides us with protection, with weapons, with tools, in order to make that possible. So Paul used a Roman soldier's armor and weaponry as an illustration for fighting against temptations. What illustrations can you think of? Let me know down in the comments. I'd love to see your creative answers. But ultimately, whatever illustration you use, we need God's help. So remember to stay close to him. And one way you can do that is by practicing your sword fighting on a regular basis. Please bow your heads with me as we close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much uh, for your truth, for your gospel, the readiness that it brings, uh, for faith, for your righteousness, and for your salvation, and for your word. And thank you so much for the creativity to come up with illustrations to help people understand all these gifts that you give us. Please continue to guide us as we grow in you, and thank you again for your love and forgiveness. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in as we talk today about the armor of God. Don't forget to click subscribe and hit the bell so that you get notifications when new content is uploaded. Remember to give us a like and to share it with someone that you think might benefit from this video. And of course, to all our viewers, remember that we're praying for you. God bless. See you later on this channel.